for those of you that didn't catch the laughter about canceling the meetings, we've been canceling our meetings lately because of the weather. And I think the best way to clear the weather up is to cancel the meeting because by the time it's time, it's cleared up. But I predict that we'll meet tonight. Our text is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 26. If you're visiting, we've been going through the book of 2 Timothy, and we're finishing up the second chapter. Paul has been speaking of Christian service, and he's illustrated it with a number of different examples. And he continues with the illustrations in verse 20 and to the end with... um, illustrations of what the church is like. And that's really where we begin, verse 20. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful, to the master prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. May the Lord... Bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. We do have a gracious, merciful Lord God. Donald Gray Barnhouse was an influential preacher of a generation ago in the mid-20th century. Many of you are familiar with him. Many of you are familiar with him because he was the man that led uh, Dr. S. Lewis Johnson to the Lord. But he was an influential minister because he spoke with depth and he spoke with clarity. And one reason he spoke with such clarity is because he had a great ability to illustrate biblical truth. In fact, he wrote a book, more than one, I think, but one book that he compiled was entitled, Let Me Illustrate. It has a number of his illustrations in that book. And in, I think it's the preface, he speaks about illustrations and the importance of them and how they are all right around us in in everything from he said the echo of hands clapping to the way light shines off metal and the reason he said is God planned everything and it all illustrates spiritual truth now that requires some perception on our part but I think that's probably true and I think Paul would have agreed with that because In 2 Timothy, he has given illustrations of Christian service from the things that were all right around him. The soldier, the athlete, the farmer, the workman. All of these illustrate Christian dedication, discipline, constancy, and consistency with the truth. Unlike false teachers who stray from the truth, and he illustrated them from the archer who shoots an arrow but misses the target. Paul finishes chapter 2 with two more illustrations of service. Those of vessels, bowls or pitchers, and servants. All of which would have been common in one of the great Roman houses of the day. Paul had probably been in some of those wealthy homes and There he would have observed these very things. So he wrote in verse 20, Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. 
The large house here represents the visible church. That's the comparison Paul is making. And just as a house has all kinds of utensils, some in, important and valuable and others not, so too the church has all kinds of people. Some have a noble function, like fine china and silver flatware. Others an ignoble function, or really a lack of function, like uh, broken plates or furniture, or things that really might be mended or might be fixed, but others might be just taken to the junkyard. Well, in the same way, there are different kinds of people in the professing church, the visible church. But the people Paul is comparing to instruments here or vessels are probably teachers, true teachers and false teachers. The word vessels suggests that. They, they are things of use. They have to do with function. Paul was called a chosen instrument or a chosen vessel in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. So the word can refer to a servant. It can refer to, in that light, an apostle or a teacher, someone who claims to be that also. And the context, I think, supports that idea. Paul is giving instruction on Christian service, and in the preceding verses, he warned Timothy about false teachers. He mentioned two by name, Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who were teaching false doctrine by denying the resurrection, not probably the resurrection of Christ, but the future resurrection of believers. In verse 19, he cited number 16, verse 15, as a kind of support for the danger of such men. It's a passage about the rebellion of Korah, a Levite, and uh, others that were with him from the tribe of Reuben. But it was the Levite that led it. It was Korah that was the leader of this rebellion that sought to usurp the authority of Moses and Aaron, also Levites, and he led this revolt. Well, he was a false leader. He was a false servant. The false has, have, have always been among the true. There were false prophets in Israel. There are false teachers today in the church. It's the Lord's parable of the wheat and tares in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Paul warned the Ephesian elders of that very thing in Acts chapter 20. When he said goodbye to them at Miletus, his final words to them when he was saying he would probably never see them again, he left them with some very important counsel and very important warnings, sobering warnings. He said, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Every church must be on guard against that danger. It had happened at Ephesus where Timothy was ministering when Paul wrote this letter to him. That, that is what the vessels of dishonor refer to, false teachers. And Paul's instruction is about how to be a valuable vessel and a, a helpful servant of the church. That's what we should aspire to be. That's what all of us should desire. And in the next verses, Paul explains how that can be, how we can be valuable vessels. First, he states in verse 21, we must separate ourselves from false teachers. Now, I don't think he means necessarily from all dialogue with them because of what he says at the end. He gives some hope that perhaps they can be won, some of them but certainly from the sense of fellowship, of equals within Christ. We're to separate ourselves. Therefore, he writes, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, these vessels of dishonor, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Paul's instruction that we cleanse ourselves keeps up the picture of the great house with its pots and pans and plates, and it emphasizes the effort that we are to give in order to make and keep ourselves useful. Throughout Paul's letters, 
He puts a lot of emphasis on our responsibility to do that. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he instructs Christians to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are saved. And the moment you put your faith in Christ, you have the gift, the blessing of eternal life. It is eternal, not temporal. It cannot be taken away. It is permanent. But Paul says, work that out. So now, every effort is to be made to manifest the salvation that we have, to show the new character that God has planted within us in uh, our thoughts as well as our deeds, our conduct. Work it out, Paul is saying. Be obedient and be diligent about it. We have the ability to do that because grace is working within us. For, Paul goes on to say, It is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Because God is presently working within us, we will, by His grace, gladly work out our salvation. And the fact that we know that God is in us, that the Spirit of God is there, enabling us, gives great hope to do that and encouragement to engage in that effort. The Christian life is not a passive life. It is active. We are literally to cleanse out ourselves. That's the idea of the word that Paul uses here of cleanse. And so we are not uh, only to, to clean the outside of the cup, as it were, but the inside as well. We, we are to give ourselves a thorough cleansing, a thorough washing. We are to be conscientious about our thoughts and our conduct, about what's within and what takes place without, as well as our uh, associations, those we spend time with, and separate ourselves from false teachers and their false ideas. Otherwise, they will have an influence and we won't. Paul wanted Timothy and God's people there in the church to have influence, to be, he said, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. But before we can be useful, we must be sanctified. So he emphasizes that as well. And sanctified basically means separated, separated from error, whether it is doctrinal error error or moral error. We, We are to be separated people. We are to be sanctified we, we cannot serve God without first having our hearts changed. We cannot be, be useful without first having hearts that are sincere, unmixed, pure. In verse 22, Paul develops this, uh, this idea and his plea for purity with both negative and positive instruction. Now flee youthful lusts, he says. We read that, at least I read that, and immediately I think of Joseph fleeing the seductive advances of Potiphar's wife. And we shouldn't exclude that from Paul's command here, but that is not Paul's only meaning, and probably not even his primary meaning. Um, He's speaking here, I think ultimately, narrowly we could say, to how we deal with these false teachers, but also broadly. And, uh, and so it's probably not so much the idea of fleeing from uh, the seductive advances of another person, but uh, the tendencies we have uh, that are, we, we bring into this world with us. Young people typically have strong passions. Children enter the world with a, a wide range of emotions. They have tantrums like outbursts in the candy aisle at uh, the grocery store. It's, uh, it's hard for them to manage discomfort. It's uh, hard for them to sit patiently through dinner. Certainly hard for them to sit patiently through a sermon. And so they're not here on the front row to, to uh, be nodding off for me. But uh, that's oftentimes the way it is. And we, we know that. That's That's youthful lusts, I think, that Paul is speaking of here. So parenting is about teaching them to rein in these things, rein in their emotions. But it's a lifelong learning process. 
what Paul calls youthful lusts don't go away with age. We don't just grow out of them. And some adults only grow into them and become set in their ways. We can think of a number of different things. Paul doesn't list them here, but impatience is an ongoing problem. Pride is a lifelong problem. We, we naturally think of ourselves first. Humility, like patience, is, uh, is a virtue that doesn't come naturally. It must be learned. And a few uh, failures help there. Paul wanted Timothy to avoid that. And so his counsel was don't let emotions rule. Reign them in. That's necessary. Pride produces ambition and stubbornness that is harmful to the church. It really doesn't help us advance the agenda of the church and the gospel and the correction of error for that matter. God does not bless people who cannot control their passions. He will no more use unclean vessels than you would set the table with dirty dishes. And so God doesn't honor selfish aims. He doesn't bless pride and self-sufficiency. And I say self-sufficiency. I don't mean that we should not uh, take matters in hand and we should not deal with the problems that we face and that we should not be aggressive in our responsibilities, but it's the attitude of, I'm the captain of my fate. I can direct my life. I'm the one that's responsible. That is not the case. The Lord is, and we need to depend on Him. I think one of the great illustrations of this, sad illustration from the Old Testament is in Second Chronicles 26, and the particular verse that I have in mind is verse 15. And it said of King Uzziah, who was a great king, a godly king, a man whose fame had spread across the world, that he was marvelously helped. He was marvelously helped by the Lord God, sovereignly caring for him, sovereignly dealing with him. And he was a godly king, responding to the help that God gave, marvelously helped until he was strong. And then he sinned and suffered greatly for it. Strength is a blessing until it fosters pride. It has been well said, I think, that God will have our weakness, but not our strength. Now that's a Pauline kind of statement because it was Paul who wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, when I am weak, then I am strong. God's power is perfected in our weakness. So if we want to be greatly used of God, then we must be clean. We must flee the things that would keep us from that, from youthful lusts, from selfish immaturity. But fleeing from is never enough. We must flee to as well. We must run from that which is bad and run to that which is good. And that is what Paul advises. Pursue, he says. And then he lists a number of virtues that we are to seek, that we're to pursue. Righteousness, faith, love, and peace. That word pursue is a word with different meanings. And it, it means just that. It means pursue, but it also has the meaning of persecute. When persecutors are described in the New Testament, this is the word that's used. So it is a word that, that here, at least, implies vigorous, zealous activity. We are, in effect, to hunt down these virtues and take them captive for ourselves, make them a part of our lives. We're to seek to have character and conduct that is ethical, that is moral, that pleases God, that reflects the image of Christ and glorifies Him. We do that by pursuing God's character, His righteousness. Dr. Bruce Walkey, who was my, uh, my Hebrew professor at seminary, explained moral righteousness as, as rooted in faith in God's Word, in His promises, and in light of that, or because of that, it, uh, it 
it acts in a way that he described as willingly disadvantaging self for the sake of others, for the sake of our neighbor, for the sake of our heavenly king. Put simply, righteousness disadvantages self to advantage others. And the great example of that is Christ himself. The king who became a servant to suffer for us and save us. So he's our model. And he's who we're to look to and he's who we're to seek to emulate. But we can't do that alone, by ourselves. We do it only with the help of others. And that's what Paul explains. That's what he says when he, he adds, with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The, the Christian life is not only active, it's a life in community. If that's a good way to put it. We don't live in isolation. We cannot live in isolation. And trying to do that is really self-destructive. Paul makes that plain in various ways. One of the great illustrations he has of the church is the body, the human body, to illustrate the body of Christ, the church. And the body is intricately connected. It's all important. And, and so it is with us. We need to do this, what he's saying here, to, to live this kind of life, this sanctified life, with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So while Paul has instructed Timothy to separate himself from false teachers, here he tells him to surround himself with godly people. Christian fellowship is essential. We all need to have that. We cannot separate ourselves from Christian company and function well. Proverbs make that plain. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so Paul says we are to pursue godliness with godly people. Those who have a pure heart. One that is offered to God with promptness and sincerity. That was John Calvin's motto. His official seal was a hand that, that offered a heart to the Lord God, and around it were the words prompt and sincere. In other words, serve without delay and without hypocrisy. That's what Paul was telling Timothy to do here. And in, in all the illustrations of service that he gives, we are, as the King James Version puts it, to flee and follow. That's how we become vessels for honor. Paul continues his instruction in verses 23 and 24, but he changes his metaphor, his image, his illustration from vessels in a house to servants in the household. Great houses had servants. But he begins with another warning against speculations, which repeats much of what he had advised earlier in verses 14 and 16, where he warned against uh, wrangling about words and empty chatter. Here he writes, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Now he's dealing with false teachers, and this is how you deal with these people who are in error. Don't get into their speculations and argue on their level. That doesn't get one anywhere, and it produces quarrels. And clearly, Paul felt very strongly about this. He, he saw danger in speculations. He's come back to this point again. Speculations, theories based on human reason, not revelation, and uh, concerned about that with good reason, because... There's something intriguing about speculations, about new ideas and theories that attract people. That was the, the attraction of what these false teachers were, were teaching. They said things that were interesting, interesting and, and caught people's imagination. But the Word of God is our standard, not the latest philosophy or, or some fashionable idea. There are lots of those. They come and they go. The only way we can know right from wrong is by a standard that is outside of ourselves, that, that comes to us from above, 
Not from within ourselves, but from outside of ourselves. And that's scripture because it is revelation. It is divine revelation. And so we are to reject whatever contradicts it. And in 2 Timothy, that was false ideas about the resurrection. That's the particular issue he's dealing with here, which denied that there, there is a future resurrection for God's people. But there were other issues in that day that had to be dealt with. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul warns against disputes about genealogies and the law, stories, myths that are spun out uh, of, of the, the, the law uh, and the, the accounts that uh, are found in the, the books of Moses that have nothing to do with the law or with that which Moses revealed. The rabbis did that. We've talked about that, I think, in the past, how you find things that they're, they're kind of gaps in our knowledge. We wonder, well, what happened here or uh, why did this occur? And they would fill in the blanks, so to speak, with their own stories, which made a point that wasn't biblical and stories that were not biblical. Well, that was what was going on in Paul's day. The issues may change with time, and they certainly do, but the principle is the same. There are questions that the world considers to be of great importance and ideas that they have that they would consider orthodox for, for them but that are really completely unprofitable and unbiblical. Paul calls them foolish and ignorant because they're contrary to God's revelation. We're to avoid getting caught up in such disputes and discussions. But Paul is not prohibiting a defense of the faith. and war He's not warning against knowing what people believe and being able to counter it, but we counter it with Scripture and we don't get into their level and into their arguments, there's no end to that. Those things are never resolved and they produce quarrels. They waste time and energy. If people won't listen to the Bible, God's revelation, when, when He speaks, when, when truth is, is reasonably explained and defended, if they're not interested in that, then we're certainly not going to win them over with quarrels, which Paul is counseling against with heated arguments. And so what he says next in verse 24 is that the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. We are to be different from that. We are to be humble. We're to be peaceful. We're to be gentle. That's how Timothy was to deal with these false teachers. And that's how he was to deal with people who were caught up in, in the error of these people. Be gentle. Now, that's not easy to do. That's, that's hard to do, particularly when you're dealing with some aggressive heretic that he would probably have to deal with. But that's Paul's instruction. Be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Those are four characteristics that must be present in a person if he or she is to be effective in ministering and become a vessel for honor. He must be kind to all. Paul describes his ministry among the Thessalonians very much like that. Uh, he said that uh, they, he and his companions, could have asserted their authority with those Thessalonians, but didn't. Instead, they were kind or gentle among them as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her children. Kindness is like that. It's not weak. It's firm, but not stern or severe, or perhaps a better way of putting it is heavy-handed, using authority in a, in a harsh way. It's, it's, it's firm, but it's mild. Uh, the Lord's servant is to be like that. And he is to be skilled spiritually, knowing the Bible, able to teach. Now that's the same word that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 3, 2 about an elder. One who's to be an elder must be able to teach. Well, here he's not talking about the elder, he's talking about everyone. We're all to be able to teach. This is one of the main concerns that Paul has in 2 Timothy, sound instruction. So, 
When we meet an opponent, we are to meet him or her with the sword of God's word. And if we don't speak, and sometimes we can't speak, the circumstances don't allow for that, nevertheless, we can certainly live what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God is sufficient for faith and practice, but a sword gets rusty when not used. So we need to be men and women who are in the Word of God, who who study it, who read it, who become increasingly familiar with the Bible and are skilled with the Scriptures. We are to be patient when wronged and correct our opponents with gentleness, not with arrogance or disrespect. How different this is from our our natural instincts, which are, are, are not to be kind and patient with those who disagree with us. Um, our, our, our tendency is probably to beat them down and win the argument even though we'll lose them. That's the natural man. We're to be different from that. What Paul is saying is the Lord's servant is to be like the Lord himself. He exhibited all four of these characteristics. Isaiah described him hundreds of years before he came as being the servant He was gentle and patient with those who opposed him. Isaiah said, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. Now that is said of God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom John said in Revelation, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. To see the Lord God in his effulgence, his glory, is something we cannot Bear. And he got a glimpse of that, and he fell at his feet as a dead man. And what did the Lord do? He raised John up, and he told him not to be afraid, just as he did throughout his earthly ministry. Be not afraid, he would say, as he cared for the weak and the guilty and discouraged. When he found men bent over like a bruised reed, he wouldn't break them. He helped them and, and, and made them straight. When their faith was just a a sputtering flame, he didn't put it out, he didn't snuff it out, but sustained it and caused it to burn. He was kind to all, to sinners, to the the woman caught in adultery. He, He was not harsh with her, did not condemn her, he defended her and forgave her. And he taught truth. He confronted men with truth, with the Word of God. That's how he dealt with with individuals. He gave light and corrected error. Even his enemies were forced to confess, never has a man taught or spoken the way this man speaks. We're to be like that. Kind, patient, gentle, able to teach, able to correct. Sound teaching must do that. It is not all positive. It should mostly be positive, I think, because I think the Word of God is positive. The Gospel is a positive message, but at times it has to be negative. Nevertheless, if we do this and model these four characteristics, Paul offers the real possibility of change in individuals and even in false teachers. He says, God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. We always have the hope of success and and seeing salvation when we speak the gospel or uh, defend against error with God's truth. The kind of uh, the kind in the calm life that is guided by the Word of God in word and deed is a powerful life. And Paul indicates that in verse 26 where He describes the trap from which these souls are delivered. They may come to their senses, Paul says, and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. That verse gives us a a peek behind the curtain, so to speak, and explains a lot about what is happening in the world today and what has happened down through history. There is an invisible reality of life that can only be known by revelation. We see the effects of it, but we don't see the cause of it 
or the reason for it. Paul gives it here. And in other places, as the other apostles as well do, there is evil in this world. There is a devil in this world. He is a person. Not a myth, not a metaphor. He is a person and he is active in the world today, waging an invisible war, a spiritual war behind the scenes. He roams about like a beast, Peter, Peter said. He sets traps and captures men like a hunter, Paul says. He captures their minds so that, as Paul indicates, they lose their senses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 4, he states, that, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel. Blinds them to spiritual truth, to spiritual reality. But not only that, Paul says he holds them captive to do his will. He has a, a plan and he inspires people to carry it out. He puts them in his service and they don't even realize it. They may deny the existence of the devil. They may say Satan is a myth. They probably do. But that explains the world. It lies in the evil one, John said. People serve him unwittingly, but they serve him willingly. John Stott describes them as both trapped and doped by the devil. It's hard to get people off dope. It's hard to open the eyes of the blind. In fact, it's impossible to do that. We struggle against a powerful enemy who is cunning and very persuasive. But the good news is the fight is not ours. It's the Lord's. It always has been. When David met Goliath in the Valley of Elah, he, he didn't outmuscle him. He brought him down with a single rock because the Lord was with him. David went out in that confidence. He went out into that valley in the Lord's power. And we do the same, not with a rock, but with the word. Paul says, perhaps God may grant them repentance. God grants repentance. That leads to forgiveness and leads to knowledge. It is his sovereign gift. Only God can give sight to the blind. Only God can deliver these people who are trapped and doped and blinded by giving them repentance unto the knowledge of the truth. That's grace. And we're saved by grace. But grace comes through God's Word. And so we must learn it and become skilled in using it. The Scriptures are sufficient. Abraham Kuyper's conversion is an example of that. Dr. Kuyper was Dutch and a genius. He was one of the leading theologians of the latter 19th and early 20th centuries. He established one of the major universities in Holland, became prime minister of the Netherlands, was a, a friend of uh, Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield, and gave the Stone lectures at Princeton seminar Seminary, lectures on Calvinism. You can get them on Amazon. It's worth having. But it wasn't by studying under brilliant men or reading great theologians that Kuiper became a Christian. It happened through his conversations with simple people. The first place he ministered as a young man was a village church. He was a liberal in his theology, but... Some in the congregation were devout Calvinists. He would visit them. And they would be kind to him, but uncompromising in their beliefs. And one had a particular influence on him. She was uh, a peasant woman, but a woman who knew her Bible and knew doctrine very well. A very bright woman. And he would visit her often, and she would speak to him about his soul and eternity and the eternal hope that she had, and she would admonish him to believe. He did. And he later wrote of how through the simple language of these people, he found reconciliation and rest for his soul. God blesses brilliant people. God uses brilliant people. 
Occasionally, he raises up a genius within the church to do great work, but he doesn't need them. He blesses us when we are all kind to others and able to teach. Those, like those simple Dutch believers did. He blesses us when we pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. When our hearts are pure and offered to God with promptness and sincerity. That's how we become valuable vessels. Vessels for honor and servants that God uses to lead others to the truth, to the gospel, to the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. Lead them out of error and into the light. God can use every one of us to do that as we apply ourselves to the Word of God. So, may God help us to do that. And by His grace, to seek holiness and to seek His sanctification. Grace is what we need. Apart from it, all men are the devil's captives and slaves. But there's a way of escape. And that's through faith in Christ, who died for our sins. If you are here without Christ, flee Satan's trap. You are in it. You may not think so, but you are. Flee to Christ, believe in Him, and be saved, and then by God's grace, serve Him. Be a valuable vessel and a helpful servant. We'll do that by God's grace. Let's end with one of the great hymns of the faith. Uh, in the Red Book, hymn 279, How Firm a Foundation. Let's stand and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn 279 in the red. Father, what a great promise that is, a great assurance and comfort to know that regardless of what we face in this life, you will never forsake us. And with us always, may we go out in that confidence and seek to serve you faithfully and well. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.